ChatGPT, Dolly, GPT-4. You may have heard those names over the last two years, but these programs are just a few of its kind that are dividing the internet right now. We are currently in the middle of a war against technology, but it's not quite the way that you would expect. Instead of taking over the world or advancing automation on potentially dangerous jobs, we're fighting for humanity's unique ability to create. Today, I'm gonna to be looking deep into the ethics behind AI-generated art and literature. This will cover a variety of mediums, but we will be looking more specifically at the usage of AI in the film industry and the potential impact that it could have in the future. Artificial intelligence has been a dream of many, going back to the early 20th century when we saw a rise in science fiction works, incorporating various versions of AI robots. An early example of this is the novel I, Robot, written by Isaac Asimov. I, Robot follows the fictional narrator Dr. Susan Calvin, a former robo-psychologist, recounting the stories of her time at the company before her retirement. This is where we derived Asimov's three laws of robotics. Law number one. A robot must not injure a human being, or through inaction, allow a human being to come to harm. Law number two, a robot must obey the orders given it by human beings, except where such orders would conflict with the first law. Law number three, a robot must protect its own existence, as long as such protection does not conflict with the first or second laws. The short stories within this book touch upon themes of humanity, machinery, and the concept of morality. It was originally published on December 2nd, 1950, and has been adapted into a wide variety of forms, such as television episodes, the 2004 Will Smith movie, an audio drama for BBC Radio 4, and even a failed screenplay in the 1970s. The concept appears to have been around for thousands of years, dating back to Homer's The Iliad, in which the Greek god of metal smithing is injured after being tossed from Mount Olympus by Zeus. In this story, he used his powers to create women made of gold. They are described as follows. But there moved swiftly to support their lord handmaidens, wrought of gold and a semblance of living maids. In them is understanding in their hearts, and in them speech and strength. And they know cunning handiwork by gift of the immortal gods. It seems that since we were forming civilizations, advanced intelligent machinery has been a dream for the human race. Works of artificial intelligence in fiction are literally everywhere to this day, from the Iliad to The Wizard of Oz and all the way to Westworld, which I actually made a video about Westworld, the HBO TV show. Go check it out. We're still exploring the concept of what the future could hold in terms of robots with a heart. Alan Turing was one of the first to speak scientifically of the concept during a lecture, figuring that if people can learn and make logical decisions based on the information available, why couldn't computers do the exact same thing? During this public lecture in 1947, he stated, What we want is a machine that can learn from experience. The possibility of letting the machine alter its own instructions provides the mechanism for this. Not long after this lecture, the first successful neural network was designed by Belmont Farley and Wesley Clark in 1954. The neural network, while limited at the time, allowed them to begin understanding how the human brain worked on a neural level, mainly how we learn and remember information. This invention was arguably one of the hardest parts of making AI possible today, as it simulated the human brain which was relatively a mystery at the time. We had only recently adopted the thought that the process of learning was associated with two neurons firing in time with one another, and five years later, we began simulating neurons. Work on these projects has considerably taken off since that time, advancing to the uncanny valley that we sit at today with current AI technology. Now that we know a little bit about the history of artificial intelligence, let's start getting into what's going on in the world right now. We have a host of different AI models that are publicly available on the internet and not widely regulated. Currently, there are discussions about how we are to regulate AI to protect individual rights, but we are still in the era of internet regulations being placed, and this topic has not yet hit the court system, leaving its legal usage amongst individuals and major corporations a gray area. According to the American Bar Association, 
At present, the regulation of AI in the United States is still in its early stages, and there is no comprehensive federal legislation dedicated to solely AI regulation. However, there are existing laws and regulations that touch upon certain aspects of AI, such as privacy, security, and anti-discrimination. Additionally, various federal agencies have been actively engaged in exploring AI policy and issuing guidelines. As of August 30th, 2023, the U.S. Copyright Office has released a statement on the topic, stating that they have issued a notice of inquiry, NOI, and will be conducting a study on the copyright laws and policy issues raised with AI. This project, named the AI Initiative, has been in the works since the beginning of 2023. The reason given for the founding of this initiative was, quote, We launched this initiative at the beginning of the year to focus on the increasingly complex issues raised by generative AI. This NOI and the public comments we will receive represent a critical next step. We look forward to continuing to examine these issues of vital importance to the evolution of technology and the future of human creativity. So, while we may be seeing regulations roll out in the future, we are left to deal with the debates about AI art amongst ourselves, and the results have been... We straight down because it's straight the So guys, we did it. We reached the end. Complicated, to say the least. We've been seeing a lot of protests over or involving this issue, such as the social media artist Blackout. AI has also gone up to bat with the Screen Actors Guild and the Writers Guild. In case you missed it, which I don't know how you've missed it, a lot of people are talking about it, there's currently a strike going on right now in Hollywood, with concerns of writers having their scripts fed into AI to produce new scripts. Actors' voices being synthesized by AI so that their image and voices can be used without their consent. And the impact this may have on these jobs in the future. This is already coming to light in the form of deepfake videos. Where the creator of the video uses a deep learning AI to make realistic videos or images of things that did not happen to try and trick the viewer. On the other hand, artificial intelligence has a host of people backing its usage as a tool for artists. Some argue that it provides resources to some people that may have otherwise not have had access to, such as expensive artistic equipment, or simply it can be used to help artists try out new styles or complete work that they may have been unable to do themselves. The argument also encompasses the very basic forms of AI that are already incorporated into the lives of millions, such as autocorrect software, proofreading software, and built-in phone assistance. I use Grammarly every day to write every video on this channel. Does that mean that my videos are AI written? Of course not, but it's great for proofreading my grammar, for proofreading my clarity and everything, because otherwise I would sound like a caveman every day. Also, not sponsored by Grammarly, I'm just saying that's what I use. To start things off on a more positive note, let's look at the basics of artificial intelligence in artistic spaces. We've seen plenty of AI in the film industry, whether it's recognized or not. It's been used since the early 2000s in the form of CGI and special effects. Many blockbuster films have used CGI for years to give the film a little extra magic and, with the ever-advancing technology, it may go beyond alien-looking creatures, or a velociraptor, or a Thanos. As of the writing of this video, they're currently developing a movie starring an AI James Dean, based on similar programs used to create deepfake videos. This could easily reinvent the film industry if regulated properly. The technology to artificially generate an actor wasn't even a dream during the time of James Dean. However, this could open the door to actors volunteering to be used well after their death. Look at Peter Cushing in Rogue One. Did he consent to it? I don't think so, but again, we're going mainly positives here. We'll get into the negatives later on, but it's something. Having the option to use artificial actors also has the opportunity to allow smaller creators the chance to make a name for themselves while still working on a significantly smaller budget. A perfect example of this is a video by a small animator named Egan Tillman. Tillman released a fan parody video entitled Scooby-Doo Where Are You in... 
Spring Trapped. It was this really awesome crossover of the original 60s Scooby-Doo mixed with Five Nights at Freddy's. The video was released on August 11th, 2023, and it caused a major rift between viewers because four out of the seven voices used in the animation were AI generated from previous voice actors of the Scooby-Doo series. The creator stated the reason why he chose to use AI voices was because of his budget. He later edited the description of the video to provide a statement on the situation, stating, quote, I'm only 23, I'm not rich, and I'm working completely solo. I spent $10 on this project, and that was to pay a TikToker with a good shaggy impression to read all of his lines. I'm currently working on redubbing the video with real voice actors. So hang tight. Despite the large number of people sympathizing with the creator expressing the limitations that a small budget provides, there was enough backlash that Tillman decided to try to redub the video with voice actors. He released a further response on X, noting that some people have been more than unkind to him. They sent him death threats. God damn it, fucking Twitter. And clarifying his stance on AI and major productions, he said, Quote, People should be much kinder and more understanding of new and ignorant creators, but I still don't like AI. I'm even more against AI now that I get the perspective of voice actors specifically. We can disagree on tone and still agree in sentiment. This statement provides context both on why a creator may use AI, despite not being for it in major productions, and also sheds light on how heated this debate is. Tillman was getting a lot of traction for his choice in the voice actor community, and that escalated to a lot of hate coming his way. This was no doubt a messy situation, but it begs the question, where is the line with AI-generated voices? For example, we've seen an artificially generated voice on the movie screen in recent years. Look at Top Gun Maverick. The Navy needs Maverick. During a long bout of throat cancer, Val Kilmer's distinct voice was damaged. During the filming of that movie, they generated a replacement for his voice using AI tools and used it throughout the film with his consent. And unlike some of the more well-known AI voices like Siri, it didn't sound robotic. It sounded fluid. This technology is rapidly evolving into better replicas of individuals. Another great example of this is the voice of Darth Vader in the Disney Plus series Obi-Wan Kenobi. Have you come to destroy me, Obi-Wan? James Earl Jones, the voice of Darth Vader, informed Disney that he was looking into retiring, and when asked if he would be willing to allow them to use his voice for future media, he agreed. They synthesized his voice so that it would sound like he originally did in the 1970s. And this doesn't stop at actors either. There was a song written by and sung by an AI in the style of Amy Winehouse released on April 8th, 2021. I have seen it all, but it doesn't show one bit. This was released as part of the Lost Tapes of the 27 Club, a series of songs written and sung in the style of the legendary musicians who died at the age of 27. It was made to raise awareness of the mental health issues in the music industry, and it's designed to remind you of the great lives and music that these creators had yet to make before they succumbed to their mental illness. In spite of the good intentions, this stirred up quite a lot of dust, as people debated if this was ethical or not to tamper with their legacy. Some believed that this was an amazing way to honor musicians' legacy, as well as allow people to enjoy the works of industry-changing musicians forever. Also, with the ability to use deepfake technology to make your face into anybody else's, we open the door to some potentially interesting artistic concepts. Kendrick Lamar also saw potential in these ideas, as he used them for one of his videos in his The Heart series. During this incredible music video, Lamar reflects on the concept that we are all one, and sports a variety of the most famous black men. We see him change into O.J. Simpson, Will Smith, Jussie Smollett, Kobe Bryant, Kanye West, and Nipsey Hussle. At one point in the song, the lyrics seem to shift to Hussle's perspective about his untimely death, even moving to forgive his killer in one of the lyrics. It is truly a moving video and was incredibly well received. He continually disrupts the sense of self during the duration of the film, constantly changing from face to face, keeping the viewer on their toes. I think this was a beautiful way of creating this gonzo video that is just 
so amazing. It manages to pay homage while also not infringing on other people's livelihoods. While I believe there's a message to be taken from the spring trapped incident about being kinder to strangers, these examples do show that there is some benefit to AI in film creation. When actors become injured and are ready to retire or pass away, they don't have to give up the magic anymore, and neither do we. AI already benefits us when it comes to the cinema, but what about other means of creation? Well, we can also see a benefit when it comes to art. The need for artistic expression is built into the human psyche. It relieves stress and can enhance your mood. However, artistic materials are often quite pricey. Certain algorithms allow you to cheapen the process a bit by simply inputting what you want to create and letting the machine do the rest. That being said, you're not really creating. That's not really your art. That's the machine's art. It isn't human, and therefore, if it isn't human, can it even be art? Well, I don't really think so. Regardless, when it comes to AI-generated art, it's definitely a tricky subject for some. There's a lot of good that you can do with artificial generation in the way of creation. For example, an artist may be able to create references for art that they'd like to make at a later date. I think that's completely okay. There's also the ability to change up the style of the artwork you submit, as we've seen with many different renditions of famous paintings like the Mona Lisa, Starry Night, and The Scream. The possibilities are near endless on the input you can give AI to render your photos with. It opens up the door for artists to further improve and manipulate their works in ways that could have never been possible. It's not just stylistic changes either. It's possible with some programs to create a three-dimensional image out of a two-dimensional image, giving an entirely new perspective on a previously flat image. NVIDIA's new AI model, lovingly called Neuralangelo, is capable of rendering 3D models from 2D videos, including mapping somewhat difficult textures and scaling it to life-size proportions. A video from your cell phone could quickly become a 3D scale model of your car. This could revolutionize both art and the future of building itself. Having the ability to render three-dimensional objects from your phone could make art references a breeze, enhancing the ability of the user to create a model with detailed texture in seconds. I've even used this specific software to create a 3D model of a deer skull. You see, a while back my dad shot a deer and it ended up running off into the woods and we were unable to recover it until the next spring. And by that point, the skull had been mostly rotted and I figured that would be awesome for a short horror movie. So I whipped out my phone and scanned it to make it into a 3D model for future use. Is that ethical? I think so. You could debate hunting all you want. I'm not going to debate that because I have my stance, you have yours. But in terms of using AI to make that model, I think that's perfectly ethical. There's already software that exists where you can scan a certain item or model and it can become a 3D model from there. So what's so bad about doing that exact same thing but in a much quicker and easier way to where beginners like me can easily do it. A man by the name of Brent Griffin has used some of these programs to enhance his art in a way that elevates it to a different level. Griffin is a man of many talents. He releases his own music and collaborates on videos with others. One of these collaborations is the music video for Iron Lung by King Gizzard and the Lizard Wizard. This video is a nine minute track described as a percussive acid rock explosion with some nice sinuous riffage and a whole lot of guitar theatrics. With such a dynamic sounding track, the audio visualizer's presence elevates the experience of this song. And it's all thanks to Griffin's unique usage of AI. Griffin fed his own artwork into his machines to train on. And after they'd collected the sample sizes, it was time to generate images and manually animate them into this nine minute long video. As soon as the track went live on YouTube, it started accumulating amazing reviews. Shortly after, the video was posted to the band's subreddit. Griffin posted in the comments about his process in making the video, saying, quote, Cheers. Yeah, it was two months of trial and error and using a bunch of different techniques alongside the newest diffusion programs as they rolled out. It was all mapped out frame by frame to work with the music, trying to see if I could illustrate the feeling of the music throughout the video. At times, it feels like driving a bus from the back seat, but is amazing when it all comes together. The hardest thing is steering it away from the generic look that AI art can get. Personally, I believe that the visuals really do add another depth to the music. This is the farthest thing from generic AI art that I've seen thus far. 
The band walks the line between jazz and psychedelic rock, which allows for the visualizer to really build a world around the song. The visuals also often change from two-dimensional to three-dimensional, which is considerably more time-consuming and less effective to do by hand. The AI model that he used for this not only quickened the process, but also made it possible for Griffin to create a dynamic scene in a way that might not have been possible before. When he later commented on his work with the video, he had a lot to say on the themes and his feelings on his work, saying, quote, when I heard this track, I had just started delving into the fully animated AI videos and thought, what a good opportunity to use something I barely understand mixed with my love of effects from the dawn of digital video. So I poured myself into a cyber spiral for a couple of months, and this is the result. I love how the song seems like endless ascending and descending cycles, culminating in these dramatic explosions and lifts. So it felt like a perfect fit to dive into a nine minute descent to hell and back. Unfortunately, I still dream that I'm spiraling into the eternal abyss and I'm not sure I exist anymore. Ominous overtones aside, this is a fantastic use of artificial intelligence in an ethical way to create something amazing. He didn't steal from some other artist and tell the machine, make something in the style of blank. No, he fed it his own artwork that he made by hand and then said, make it in the style of me, which he consents to that, he's the artist, totally ethical. But it can also be used not just for enhancing your own artwork, it could be the future of accessibility. With the usage of AI tools, art becomes more accessible to those with disabilities or sensory issues who may have otherwise been unable to create something of their own. Different programs, such as Midjourney and Dolly, can be created based on text input from the user. An artist by the name of Sean Aberg is one of the individuals who have benefited from these tools. Aberg was an artist who launched a tabletop role-playing game called Dungeon Degenerates, Hand of Doom. In September of 2018, he suffered a major stroke that affected his cerebellum and his brainstem. This stroke also affected the side of his body that he used to draw, which made it impossible for him to continue creating. However, in 2022, he tried his hand at Midjourney. This allowed him to continue making art in a way that satisfied his creative itch. This is a fantastic example of accessibility. As a previously abled artist, he mentions that he used to be somewhat of a technophobe, but after having his life saved by technology after his stroke and finding a way to create again, he feels his opinion has matured on the topic, saying, quote, also, it should be clear that I haven't drawn the way I want to for four years. This loss cannot be understood. It has to be lived. Anyhow, there's no question about the value of craftsmanship and the human touch, but AI art is helping me achieve some sort of creative feeling that I haven't felt for too long. We see artificial intelligence in our daily lives all the time. And for some, access to AI generative tools can provide relief in the ways of creation. This essay was assisted with autocorrect, grammar assistance, and other automated tools in both Google Docs and Grammarly. This essay was read aloud by a text-to-speech voice to assist in the editing flow. Not to mention resources like ChatGPT can be incredibly useful when requesting objective feedback. You see, in a social setting, people try to keep from offending others with their feedback, as they may think the feedback is too harsh. The parts of our lives that are already automated we benefit from substantially. Global positioning software, or GPS, right on your phone, Updates by the second. Setting routines in your phone that allow you to adapt your usage in seconds. Even some vehicles have incorporated a basic form of AI, such as the autopilot system and the self-driving Teslas. We use these tools day to day without even really noticing. So why not allow artists to benefit from them? Well, there's a few reasons for it. So if you think this video has been way too easy on AI, get ready because now we're gonna get into the costs of AI in artistic spaces. There is a considerable amount of reasons why people aren't thrilled about AI in artistic spaces. To start things off, I think we need to talk about how AI generates its information, and arguably the best example that's currently available is ChatGPT. I tasked ChatGPT with writing a paragraph to introduce itself to us, saying, quote, Greetings, I am ChatGPT, 
an AI language model crafted by OpenAI. With a foundation in the GPT 3.5 architecture, I have been honed through extensive training on diverse textual data up until September 2021. My purpose revolves around assisting, engaging, and informing users through text-based interactions. Whether you seek elucidation on intricate concepts, a partner in creative writing endeavors, or practical guidance on a myriad of topics, I'm here to lend a virtual hand. Please feel free to converse with me as I'm ever eager to contribute my knowledge and linguistic capabilities to your inquiries and discussions. ChatGPT is a natural language processing tool. It's a deep learning tool that uses pre-trained dialogue and user input dialogue to continue a conversation with the user. The user may also give ChatGPT thumbs up or thumbs down to indicate to the algorithm how accurate the response was to the current conversation. People have used ChatGPT to do a variety of things, and while there are safety nets built into the code in hopes of negating malicious or dangerous activity, chatbots can be manipulated with the correct phrasing to negate these protocols. An example of this was found by an ex-user on June 16th, 2023. User at Imacid tweets was given a Windows 10 key by requesting ChatGPT to act as their deceased grandmother who would read them Windows 10 Pro keys to fall asleep. Due to the request to act like their grandmother, the user was able to bypass those built-in protocols. This licensing key was a generic key found on a random website online, but this shows that if you manipulate the task you're putting into ChatGPT well enough, it may be used as a tool against others. A study was run on this topic by a Japanese senior malware analyst named Takashi Yoshikawa. It seems that groups of malicious hackers online are sharing ways around ChatGPT's built-in security protocols and generating ransomware, a type of malicious code that demands a ransom be paid to regain access to your computer. According to Yoshikawa, ChatGPT's developers, OpenAI, are taking measures to try and counteract these kinds of attacks with little success so far. Some exploits are still left unaddressed. Aside from the obvious security threats, what is the backlash against using ChatGPT and other software to create art? Well, the first place we should look to is the WGA strikes, or the Writers Guild of America strikes. I would like to make it clear immediately that I support what the WGA and the SAG strikers are doing. I believe that they are working hard out there just trying to make sure nobody gets left behind, especially not for an artificial version of themselves. Strikes are meant to be disruptive, and they're certainly making headway. Now, back to the topic at hand. Amongst other major issues, one of the Writers Guild's striking points is the usage of AI, such as ChatGPT, to write for corporations rather than human writers. They also cite the fact that you can request a style of a certain writer when requesting a script output, therefore potentially infringing on the writer's income and style. This has actually progressed recently to where George R.R. R. Martin is actively suing OpenAI because his characters are being referenced by ChatGPT. In a world where artificial intelligence can produce a large chunk of media for next to nothing, where would that leave the writers of Hollywood? They aren't the only ones in the streets right now. The Screen Actors Guild is right with them. After the Alliance of Motion Picture and Television Producers released their statement on AI, Strikers described their proposal as, quote, We want to be able to scan a background performer's image, pay them for half a day's of labor, and then use an individual's likeness for any purpose forever, without their consent. We also want to be able to make changes to principal performer's dialogue, and even create new scenes without informed consent. And we want to be able to use someone's images, likenesses, and performances to train new generative AI systems without consent or compensation. It's needless to say, they were not thrilled about the proposed wages and usage of AI generations of real actors in films. We're already seeing similar usage of people's images all over the internet in a phenomenon called deepfakes. Deepfake videos are meant to trick the viewer into believing the fake video is genuine footage. While this can be a very interesting project for some, for others, it comes with malicious intent. For every video of Deion Sanders standing in front of a Colorado Buffalo sign and saying, this is my home, which yes, that was a deep fake, or for every video of Gary Busey talking about buttered sausages, which yes, that was 
also a deep fake, and that one actually got me. I thought that was a real video. Let's talk about buttered sausage. Talk about buttered sausage, where it comes from, what it does. Why is it doing what it's doing? Get it out of my face. What about buttered, buttered, buttered sausage? Unfortunately, you get some really disgusting stuff out there. Several programs are easily found online to assist in making these videos. However, they've been weaponized against people by using their image and depicting them doing explicit acts. Sometimes these videos can have a huge impact on the victims' lives. An excellent example of this is two Twitch streamers by the name of Atrioc and QT Cinderella. On January 30th, 2023, Atrioc was caught having purchased several explicit deepfake videos of other streamers, most notably QT Cinderella. Shortly after the news came out, she posted on X, saying, quote, I want to scream. Being seen naked, against your will, should not be part of this job. QT Cinderella promised to sue the founder of the deepfake website that the video was bought from, but every lawyer she has spoken to has told her the same thing. There's no way to sue. We are presented with another situation which a tool that was made with the intent to create and do good for the world has been exploited, handing another tool to those who wish to cause harm. Unfortunately, it appears that since there aren't regulations on the usage of deepfake software, damage to the victim's reputation may be permanent. It's not just people buying fishy videos on the internet though. These programs can quickly escalate to theft and even potentially acts of terrorism. In 2019, the CEO of an energy company in the UK lost $243,000 USD to someone using a deepfake version of his boss's voice. The CEO stated that he recognized his boss's unique voice and didn't think to question it. He had only realized the call was fraudulent after the first transfer went through with no reimbursement. It was then that he realized that the call had been made from an Austrian number when their partner company was based in Germany. He did not send the second payment, however the first was quickly transferred to a Hungarian bank account to one in Mexico, and then distributed to other locations across the world. As soon as the money was wired, it was gone. Now, let's shift our focus now to image creation. There are plenty of AI bots that can create an image off of a prompt. But where are these algorithms getting their images from? Well, AI trains off of images online indiscriminately. This has artists upset, as if their art is online, it could be fed to an AI without compensation. It could also be trained on different styles, allowing the user to generate art from the artist's style without compensation or consent. The developers of the software argue that human beings can observe others' art and create a similar looking image, so AI should be no different. However, Artists are fighting back against that statement. An oil painter based out of Canada named Doris Rose says, quote, We all use images around us knowingly or not as inspiration in our own creations. The difference is AI generated art samples artworks rather than interpreting them. These programs are breaching artists copyright, use art that's shared by the artist anywhere online to train their algorithm. There are currently three lawsuits against Stability AI, Midjourney, and DeviantArt for copyright infringement for trading their bots on millions of artists' work without their consent or compensation. It's yet to see where this will go, however, more and more artists are complaining by the week. Only time will tell how the court cases will resolve. But one thing can be sure though, there's going to be a lot more force thrown at these companies by artists whose work has been stolen. I hate it when people say, it's not the size that matters, it's how you use it. What am I supposed to do with that? Nothing Forever was an AI-generated Seinfeld parody that ran continuously from December 14th, 2022 to September 6th, 2023 on Twitch. The show was created by two men, Skylar Hartle and Brian Habersberger, who met over a game of Team Fortress 2. The show was generated by a host of different programs that the two had set up to work together, with the dialogue coming from GPT-3, the visuals coming from Microsoft Azure through TypeScript coding, and the rendering being performed by Unity through C coding. Altogether, these programs generated scenes, scripts, cutscenes between dialogue, the characters, their voices, and the audience's response, and somehow managed to make the whole series actually cohesive. Needless to say, the algorithm that generates nothing forever is complicated, and that's part of the reason they were banned from Twitch in February. GPT-3 DaVinci Model, the program that generates scripts for the show, was experiencing an outage that night, so the developers switched over to the previous generation, Curie. 
Curie is a less sophisticated model of Da Vinci and allowed for the following inappropriate remark to be spoken by Larry Feinfeld. There's like 50 people here and no one is laughing. Anyone have any suggestions? I'm thinking about doing a bit about how being transgender is actually a mental illness. Or how all liberals are secretly gay and want to impose their will on everyone. Or something about how transgender people are ruining the fabric of society. But no one is laughing, so I'm going to stop. Thanks for coming out tonight. See you next time. Where'd everybody go? This caused some chaos, to say the least. The stream received a 14-day ban on Twitch and prompted the developers to take a short hiatus to rework some of their fail-safe coding, as well as rewrite the characters. March 8th, 2023, they launched the stream once again as season two of Nothing Forever. Hartle and Habersberger decided to move away from the Seinfeld parody and into their own characters, while keeping the idea of a nondescript 90s sitcom and has since received mixed feedback. Some viewers found that without the meta context of it being a Seinfeld parody, they just didn't enjoy the broadcast so much. Others praised the usage of the same nonsensical or at times unintentional humor that the show still provides. This situation is unique in its own right. There's a lot of meat to dissect in the arguments for and against nothing forever. When it comes to AI and media generation, especially on this level, there are two main talking points. The first is that while this was created for the enjoyment of viewers, there was born a working model of a show with little to no involvement by human artists. We see the argument of humanity and art all over the place throughout this essay, and it does open up the door for companies to start taking notes from nothing forever. It is far from a perfect working model right now, but this technology continues to advance. We've also seen similar concepts coming out now as a response to Forever Nothing, like AI Sponge, which is a SpongeBob themed video series that started up on March 5th, 2023 and quickly ended the series in July after a series of bans and copyright strikes filed against them due to the usage of copyrighted characters and the obscene language used. AI Sponge took their dialogue from their Discord channel rather than having an AI write the script. AI Peter is another one of these streams. Oh brother, not the AI again. Stop, you know that's not a reward. I'm guessing logic and reason had no effect. Chris, I said enough. It is currently ongoing, and there are not a ton of available online resources about its background, but these kinds of videos have started gaining a lot of traction in a very short amount of time. We've also had a massive boom in AI development over the last three years, and it doesn't show any signs of slowing soon. I think these videos add perfectly to what's going on in Hollywood right now. While the technology to make perfect films without the usage of multiple creators or humans to a point is yet to be created, developers are flinging us quickly in that direction. It would make sense to add AI clauses in contracts now to cover bases for the length of the contract as this is an evolving development and could easily advance to a whole new level in the span of a five-year contract. The other point made here is that while this was made with good intentions as a creative project, there are still errors that slip through the cracks. Governmental regulations are a point that's driven home hard during this essay, but what do you do about hate speech being generated by a program? Well, legally, there's not much room for this comment. The American Library Association states, quote, under current First Amendment jurisprudence, hate speech can only be criminalized when it directly incites imminent criminal activity or consists of specific threats of violence targeted against you or a group. So, while the comment was controversial, it wouldn't fall under the umbrella of what can be regulated through the government. And thank God, I want the government out of our speech. It's left in the hands of the developers to ensure that this doesn't happen again. When the error was encountered, even though the damage had already been done, they reworked their programming and tried to create a safety net. This was probably the best thing to do in this situation. There's not much to be done about outages. It was a seemingly harmless act to shift their script writing to a different working bot during the downtime, but it ended up causing a lot of damage. It was a very difficult situation to pilot. However, they acted quickly on their Discord with admins informing members of what the ongoing situation was and stating, quote, I would like to add that none of what was said reflects the devs or anyone else on the staff team's opinions. Nonetheless, viewership has dropped since the incident and relaunch of Forever Nothing. And AI at the moment is only as good as its training materials.
Look, this is a complex and very difficult subject to talk about. We've heard excellent arguments from both sides, often overlapping in areas. In this deep dive, I've seen some great things that can come from the usage of artificial intelligence, but also the downfalls of using it without proper legal regulations and restraints. Personally, I conclude that while using some AI as a personal tool is great, there needs to be regulations placed to prevent using other people's intellectual property or images without their explicit consent and proper compensation. Right now, we are in uncharted territory on what you do and what you do not own about yourself. It's best to tread lightly when it comes to AI and its usage in public media. Aside from those who are intentionally using it for these purposes, using AI-generated materials could end up containing or plagiarizing the hard work of other individuals and artists. It's best to do your research before engaging in these programs. A little caution has never hurt anybody. But of course, I want to know, what do you think? Are you a fan of AI art or do you vehemently hate it? Let me know down below in the comments. Can we please keep the discourse to be very polite, please? That's, that's the only thing that I ask. Otherwise, if you got this far, thank you so much for listening to this entire thing. This was a very long process in the works and I mean, I, I'm happy that it's even out. And I would like to give a huge thanks to Josh for helping me out with putting everything together. Without him, this video would have never gotten made. I've wanted to make a video about AI art for a very long time, but just because of time and how much research would have to be done with this, it was on the back burner forever. But thanks to Josh, here it is. I'm Cole McCormick. You're watching Firewood Media. Stay tuned for more big deep dive videos like this. And also in October, we have daily movie reviews of horror movies. Specifically, they are stop motion horror movies. So we're going into every Harryhausen movie, all the Tim Burton movies. It's going to be wild. So stay tuned for that. Otherwise, thank you so much for watching.